All right, yeah, so we've got one last lesson for you this semester, and that's about absolute extrema. Um, this is going to actually be a pretty good opportunity to, for us to review a lot of the stuff that we covered in our third unit um, when we talked a lot about curve sketching and talked about the relationship between F, F prime, and F double prime in their graphs. Um, so let, let's, let's get started here. Um, really, there's just going to be two problems here on this notes. It'll be a pretty short notes. Um, but basically, what I want you to do is understand the difference between a relative maximum and an absolute maximum. Okay. So with this function, um, yeah, we'll answer some questions. That'll be a good review here. So I just want you to think about these and, you know, just do a little self-check and make sure you know how to answer these questions. Like part A says, determine the critical values of f of x. So what does that mean? What are the critical values of f of x? What do I mean when I say find the critical values? What? Zeros of the derivative. Zeros of the derivative. Yes. It'll be the x values where the first derivative equals zero. So we can find these critical values pretty easily. We just need to find the derivative. So f prime, and there's nothing fancy going on here with f. There's no chain rule, no product rule, no transcendentals, none of that. Just regular old power rule, the good old days of power rule. Okay, negative 3x squared plus 6x. Now to find the critical values, we need to set this equal to 0 and solve for x. So we can set it equal to 0. And then how would we solve this? How do, how do you solve a quadratic like this? Yeah, factor, what, what are we going to factor out here? Yeah, basically the GCF, right? So the negative 3x, um, so yeah, negative 3x times uh, x minus 2. So where are my critical values? Yeah, 0 and 2. So we have x equals 0 and x equals 2. Now, just because that these are critical uh, values does not guarantee that there's going to be an extreme value there. However, if there is an extreme value, if there is a relative maximum, a relative minimum, it will occur at these critical values. So these are potential values where we have extrema. What we have to do is we have to test to find out if they're extrema or not and uh, along the way decide if they're relative maxima or relative minima. So how do we check and verify whether or not these x values represent maxes or mins or maybe neither? Yeah, good. We want to create basically a, a little number line chart, a little sign chart for f prime. Label the critical values, and those will be your uh, the partitions for your number line. It's probably a good idea to label it as F prime, especially when we start thinking about the justification. And all we need to do is choose a value from a representative from each interval that we've partitioned off and plug it back into F and find out, or I'm sorry, into F prime and find out whether F prime is positive or negative. And really what we're looking for here is a sign chain. If the sign changes from positive to negative, that means that the slope of f is changing from positive to negative, right? If the slope of f goes from a positive slope to a negative slope, we know that there's a lo uh, local or a relative maximum there. However, if the slope or f prime goes from negative to positive, we know we have a local minimum there. So if I plug in some number like, uh, let's say, negative 1 into f prime, and I'll use this factored version of f prime here because then I'm just multiplying two numbers together, right? If I plug in negative 1, I have a positive number times a negative number, which would be negative. So between negative infinity and 0, the slope is negative, the slope of f. In between 0 and 2, uh, so let's say we pick a number like 1. If I plug that into x, I get a negative times a negative, which is positive. So the slope of f is 
positive. F, we can say, is increasing on that interval. What I want you to avoid saying here is that the slope is increasing. We don't know that the slope is increasing yet. We would need to look at the second derivative to determine that. If we pick a number like, I don't know, 10 or 100 and substitute that into x, we would get a negative times a positive, which is negative. So now that we have analyzed the sign of the prime, okay, and that's really what we want to be looking for for these justifications are the signs of the primes. Okay, Most of your justifications are going to be something along the lines of, oh, f prime is positive, or f prime is zero, or f double prime is positive, or negative, or whatever. Um, so in this case, we can say that uh, we have a relative maximum, or actually we'll start with the zero, so I guess we'll start with a relative minimum. at x equals zero because the slope of f or the value of f prime goes from being negative to positive. All right, we've got a slope. If f is this curve here, you can see the slope changes from negative to positive causes that relative minimum to occur. Um, similarly, we can say that we have a relative maximum at x equals 2 uh, because f prime is going from being positive to negative. Okay, if we have a positive slope on f followed by a negative slope, you can see that we should probably have a, a relative maximum. Okay. Yeah, do you all remember, is this starting to come back to you? It's been a little while, but this is like the perfect time, I think, to start reviewing this stuff is like right before you forget everything over the break. Yeah. Uh, so part C, determine the points of inflection. How do we find, not necessarily like the whole process here, but how do we get started? Like where do we look for the points of inflection or how do we find them? Yeah. That's exactly right. We're looking for a point, and that's actually what a point of inflection is, is a point where the concavity changes. And we know, we, uh, we know when the concavity changes based on the sign of f double prime, the second derivative. The second derivative gives you information about the concavity of, the, of f. So if the second derivative is positive, f will be concave up. If the second derivative is negative, then f will be concave down. So we're looking for that change in concavity to have a point of inflection. So algebraically, you would find it by first finding that second derivative. We have the first derivative up here. Uh, so we just need to use power rule again. We get negative 6x plus 6. So the point of inflection, if there is one, occurs when the second derivative is 0. Just like with the critical values corresponding to extrema, though, just because you have this subcritical value where the second derivative is zero doesn't necessarily mean you have a point of inflection there, but if there's a point of inflection, it has to be at one of these numbers. Um, so anyway, we have zero equals negative six X plus six. So what is X? Where do we potentially have a point of inflection? I'll be careful. So if you solve that equation, what would be the first step? Yeah, so Oh, okay, so you're going like a factoring route. Yeah, that, that could work too. Um, I was just thinking you'd just subtract six and then divide by negative six. But you could factor and then divide and then subtract. You could do that too. Um, yeah, either way though, you're not going to get six. What are you going to get? One. one. Yeah. So x is one. That means that we potentially have a point of inflection and we can verify whether or not that point of inflection exists by creating a little number line here with our subcritical value of one being the partition. And then just like we did for to identify the extrema, we're gonna make a little science chart here and plug values in from each interval into, in this case, F double prime. So if I plug in zero, which would be on that left interval, negative six times zero is just zero, plus six would be positive. So between negative infinity and one, let me label this line as f double prime. f double prime is positive. 
That means that F is concave up on that interval. Now, if we plug in a number like 10 or really anything bigger than one, we are going to get a, uh, uh, a negative number. Negative six times 10 would be negative 60 plus six so would still be negative. And so we do have a sign change here and that's really all we care about. We don't really care whether or not it's changing from concave up to concave down or vice versa. You know, that might be a different kind of a question, but if we're just finding the point of inflection, all we need to know is where does the sign on F double prime change? So we can say there's a point of inflection at x equals 1, and our justification or our reason for that is because f double prime changes sign. We don't have to give more detail. I mean, if you say that it goes from positive to negative, you're not going to get points off or anything. That's still true. Um, that's just more information than you need. Any questions so far? All right. Part D says, determine the intervals where F is increasing or decreasing. Not where the slope is increasing or decreasing, but whether F is increasing or decreasing. So F will be increasing anytime F's slope is positive. So in other words, F is increasing if F prime is positive. F is decreasing if F prime is negative. And we already created a sign chart for f prime, so we don't need to like redo that. You know, I might sketch it down here just so, um, you know, I just have it a little bit easier to look at, so I don't have to keep scrolling up. Um, but here's the sign chart we created back on part D for f prime. And so there's no additional work to do here. It's just an interpretation question at this point, uh, which is to say, okay, well, I see that uh, f prime is positive between zero and two, therefore f is increasing there. So that's going to be how we answer this question. F is increasing on the interval 0 to 2. And the reason is, again, like the reasoning, like a lot of times just goes back to just like the signs of the primes, you know, signs of primes. What, what is true about F prime? And that is F prime is positive. Similarly, we can say F is decreasing on these two intervals, uh, negative infinity to zero and two to infinity because F prime is negative. Part E is asking about the concavity of F. So F prime gives you information about the slope of F or the rate of change of F. And the second derivative gives you information about the concavity of F or the rate of change of the rate of change of F, the acceleration. So uh, F will be concave up when the second derivative is positive and concave down when the second derivative is negative. And we already analyzed the signs of F double prime, so we don't need to redo all that work. We've got a sign chart, you know, back on part C. I'll just redraw it here just so I have it convenient, a little bit more convenient down here. Um, so we already know where the graph's going to be concave up and down here because we've already created this, this sign chart. Um, so we, we'll go ahead, we can go ahead and answer this. So F is concave up um, on the interval negative infinity to one because the second derivative is positive and f is concave down on the interval one to infinity for the opposite reason f double prime is negative questions so far? This is all the old stuff, yeah? This is all from unit three. Um, 
The last question on here is sort of new. Now we did have one question kind of snuck into one of the Delta math quizzes we did back when we were talking, we first learned about relative extrema that asked about absolute extreme. And uh, that was kind of an accident. I didn't really mean for that to happen at that point. Um, but now's a good, a good time ever to go and just really like finalize what I mean by absolute extrema. So a local extreme, like a local maximum, for instance, is the highest point on the graph in a small interval. So you might think of like, you know, what is the highest elevation you can get to in Austin, Texas? Now, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's probably like one of the, you know, big condos downtown, right? It's probably about as high as you can get. I don't think there's any like mountains or anything. Um, but so that would be like our local or our relative maximum height that we could attain reasonably. Um, the global or the absolute maximum would be like the highest altitude of the whole world, right? So in the case of like in, in the context of looking at functions, it's like the maximum, the complete maximum value that the function takes on in any given, in the interval that's given. So if the interval here is from negative two to three, and we're looking for the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum value that the function takes on, we need to check all of the little local minima and all the local maxima and see what's the highest one. But there's one more piece to this, and that is that the endpoints might be our absolute extreme values. Because let's say we have a graph, um, let's say our graph does something like this. Okay, and um, let's say we cut it off here and here. And I'll erase this. Oh, I took out my whole thing. So something like this, right? You could just see at a glance that the absolute maximum would be this location, right? And if we already knew where all the relative extre extreme values were, we could just identify what the largest y value is at those extremes. But if I were to ask you what's the absolute minimum, it would not occur at that relative minimum, but rather this point down here on the endpoint, right? Like that, that point is definitely way lower. And so when you're trying to determine the absolute extreme values, you have to consider both the critical values where you're finding the relative max and relative minimum, but also the endpoints. And that's sort of like the new little thing that you got to check as well. And so probably the easiest way to, to answer this question is just to create a table of values for X and for F where you check all of the relative extreme values and the endpoints. So the endpoints here would be at x equals negative 2 and x equals 3. And then we've got relative extreme uh, extrema at, let's, let me scroll up here because I don't remember what they were, uh, at 0 and 2. Right? We've got a minimum at 0 and a maximum at 2. Right, so we've got a minimum at zero. Was that was it a minimum at zero? I think it was. Yeah, maximum at two, and then endpoints at negative two and three. And so really, all you have to do is just substitute all these numbers in back into f and identify which one's the biggest and which one's the smallest. Because if there's an absolute maximum, it'll be one of these numbers, or it'll be at one of these numbers. So unfortunately, we do have to do a little arithmetic here. Kind of annoying, but there's really no way around it. Um, so let me rewrite this function so I don't have to. Negative x cubed plus 3x squared minus 9. Okay, so we're going to just substitute all of these x values back into that function. So, yeah, at negative 2, let's say... Uh, f of negative 2 is negative negative 2 cubed plus 3 times negative 2 squared minus 9. Um, what would that be? Uh, 8, so negative 8 plus 12. So it'd be so negative 2 cubed would be negative 8, but then you have this extra negative out there. So it would be positive 8. Yeah, so positive 8. Um, Sorry, positive 8 plus 12 would be 20, minus 9 
would be 11. Double check my arithmetic there, uh, but I think it's 11. Okay, now let's check zero. Usually zero is pretty easy to calculate because you're just multiplying a bunch of zeros. So we have zero plus zero minus nine would be negative nine. For the maximum, or the relative maximum, and maybe I should be a little bit more precise here. We have a relative max, just to make you know make it clear that those are not necessarily the absolute maximum. Min. F of two should be a similar answer here. Let's see, two cubed is eight, and so we get negative eight plus twelve is negative four minus. Help me out here. Wait a minute. Negative eight plus four. four yeah, ne okay, negative five. Yeah, I was coming up with something else in my head. Thank you. Negative five. And then our last endpoints at three. So f of three. Three cubed, uh, three times three is nine, times three is 27, so negative 27. And then, well, that should, be. that should be a three. Yes, thank you. Plus 27 would be zero, negative 27 plus 27, and then minus nine would be negative nine. Okay, so of all those outputs, what's the biggest one? What's our largest output? 11, yeah, so at 11, this is our global or our absolute maximum value of F. So if we're trying to like answer the question, we would say something like the absolute maximum value of F on the interval negative two, three is 11. What's the absolute minimum value? What's the like the lowest point on this interval? Yeah, that'd be negative nine. We actually hit it twice, but that's okay. It's still the the minimum, the absolute minimum value that the function takes on. So the absolute minimum value of f on that interval is negative nine. Now there's a blank graph there in case you just want to kind of visualize what this graph looks like. That's not really um, that important. We don't really have to worry too much about the graph. But if you were to plot like all these numbers we're coming up with here are points on the graph. So if you're just curious what you know f of x looks like, you could just plot some of those points like, uh, well, negative 211, which would be uh, way above here. So I'm not going to bother plotting that. Zero negative nine would be let me zoom in here. Is that negative nine? Yeah. That uh, would be right here. Two comma negative five would be here. And three comma negative nine is here. Um, and we know something about the value at x equals zero and x equals two. We know those are relative extrema. Specifically, x equals zero corresponds to a local minimum and x equals two is a relative maximum. So really what's happening is you have a graph that does something like this. Uh, and this is just gonna go up pretty high here. And that's just a rough sketch, but you can see how you can come up with this rough sketch with just this little bit of information about where the relative extrema are. And uh, you could plot the point of inflection too. I think it'd probably be a right, right around there. Um, you could figure out exactly where it is by just plugging in x equals one, but you don't really need to do that. Okay, so this little, you know, of this last question, it also says justify your answer. And it looks like we answered the question, so you might be worried that we didn't actually justify it, but on absolute maximum or absolute minimum questions, the table that you generate here is the justification. You don't have to make a separate statement. You don't have to say, oh, uh, 11 is the absolute maximum because it's the largest value between all the critical 
values and, and the input. You don't have to be that wordy about it. This process of creating a table and determining the absolute extremes from the table is called the candidates test. So you don't like technically need to know this by name. I don't think like on the AP test they're going to be like, use the candidates test to do this. I mean, they might. This is what it's talking about, though. It's just constructing a table with your critical values and your endpoints and deciding what's the absolute max or min, depending on what the question is asking for. So let's just run through the steps one more time here. Uh, so it says, let f be uh, negative x to the fourth plus 8x squared minus x. Determine the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum. So first, we're going to step one is to find the critical values. Okay, those are going to be where you potentially have a maximum or minimum, and those are going to be like entries in the table that we're going to create. So f prime is negative 4x cubed plus 16x. And so to find the critical values, I'm going to set that equal to zero. To solve this cubic, I'm going to start by factoring out the GCF which uh, I'll say is negative 4x. So negative 4x times x squared minus 4. Is that right? Uh, hold up. Yeah. So where are the critical values? Zero, Thank you. 0, 2, and negative 2. And one of these we can actually ignore for the purposes of this problem, because we're only interested in finding the absolute max or minimum on this interval between negative one and three. So any X value that's outside of that interval, we're not even gonna consider anyway. So, you know, negative two is a critical value, but we don't need to consider it. Okay. Like when we construct our table, we can ignore that one. Step two, evaluate the function at the critical values. Okay, again, we don't need to worry so much about zero and two um, because, uh, I'm sorry, we don't need to worry so much about negative two because that's not within that interval, but we do need to evaluate f of zero and f of two. So f of 0, just going to substitute that in. 0 plus 0 minus 6 is going to be negative 6. And f of 2, so 2 to the 4th, 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. So negative 16 plus 8 times Four. I'm going to have to write this down. I can't do all that in my head. <laughs> Negative, what do we say? 16 plus 8 times 4 is 32 minus 6. What does that come out to be? 10. Okay. Yeah, that's a little bit too much to do without writing it down, I think. Um, okay, so we got those two values. We're good to go. And then it says evaluate the function at the endpoints of the interval. So not only do we need to consider the critical values, but we also need to consider the endpoints. So we want to evaluate f of one, uh, negative 1 and f of 3. So zoom out a little bit so I can fit that equation on there. Um, so, yeah, if we plug in negative 1, that would be, well, negative 1 plus eight would be seven. Seven minus six is one, I think. Is that right? Negative one plus eight is seven minus six is one. I think that's correct. And then if I plug in three, uh-oh, three to the fourth. That'd be like nine times nine. So negative 81, this one I'm, I think I'm gonna write down. Negative 81, plus eight times nine is 72 minus six. Uh, so negative 81 and negative six would be negative 87 
So 87 minus 72, 15. So this would be negative 15. All right, and you can even, like, you don't have to, but if you just want to kind of get a visual here, you know, negative 1 comma 1 would be, like, roughly here. Uh, 0 comma negative 6 would be here. 2 comma 10 is up here. 3 comma negative 15 is down here. So the graph is doing something like this, right? So just at a glance, you can see where the absolutes are going to be, right? Like the absolute maximum is going to be up here at 10. The absolute minimum is down here at negative 15. But really what the AP test graders are going to be looking for, they probably won't even be given a graph. I just like to sketch one out so you can visualize it. Um, is they're looking for that table. Yes, sir. Oh, did I mess one up? Yes, yeah, so help me out here. What should it be? Um, well, yeah, let's, let's, let's break it down. Here. I think it would be 1 plus 8 minus 6. Oh, so is it 2? Let's see. So negative, let's see. So negative 1 to the 4th would be positive 1. There's an extra negative sign on there, so it would be negative 1 plus 8 minus no, I think it is one. I think we are. Oh, did you? Was it the negative at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. You just gotta be careful with that. That negative sign in front of here is not underneath like the exponent. It's not being exponentiated. So whatever you get for the x to the fourth, you're gonna slap on a negative sign like afterwards. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and just like create our table of values and answer our question. So here's x. Here's f of x. Our endpoints are negative 1 and 3. The critical values in between are 0 and 2. We've already done all the arithmetic here. So at negative 1, it's 1. At 0, it's negative 6. At 2, it's 10. And at 3, f of x is negative uh, 15. So our absolute maximum is happening here. And our absolute minimum is negative 15. So, to, and that's the justification. You just show the table. That's really all you need. Uh, and then you, you'll say that um, uh, the absolute maximum of F on the interval negative 1 to 3 is uh, 10. So the value of the maximum is 10. The value of the minimum on that same interval is negative 15. And so that's absolute, uh, that's what our absolute extreme are. Okay, it's just the, the basically the biggest and the smallest outputs that the function has on that interval. You won't very often be asked for this like on an entire function because most of these functions are just going up to positive negative infinity and will not have a global or an absolute maximum. So that's why usually when they ask these questions, it'll be on an interval and you'll have to use the candidate's test to make sure that those endpoints of the interval aren't like the answer. And oftentimes they are. Uh, do you guys have any questions?